can we welcome Ella Spencer Mills? Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you, first of all, Marlene, for uh, the generous invitation for me to speak today. Uh, and I'll just go, just go straight in. Um, when the first National Black Art Convention took place in October 1982, the social context, as we've seen portrayed in Keith Piper's wonderful, now I don't know if this is correct, video essay. Am I allowed to say video essay? Yes. <laughs> um, Keith Piper's wonderful video essay was a Britain rife with racism, riots and resistance. A cross-section of black and Asian artists and art writers studying and graduating at that time began producing work in direct response to the racism and violence that not only shaped the political landscape of Britain but which permeated their lived experiences in the everyday. Meanwhile, I was just a toddler, <coughs> living in a realm of futuristic possibilities where the wars were otherworldly and where danger was a fantasy even I could fend off. My 1980s was a world apart from that illustrated by the art of the black art movement. Being in primary school for most of the 80s, my awareness of any significant political and cultural events was a news headline haze of poll tax, the IRA, miners, the Chernobyl and Hillsborough disasters, and the Lockerbie plane crash. But my everyday 80s was paper bags of sweets after school, holidays, holidays to Spain, practicing at playtime what I now realize were highly inappropriate dance routines to Sunita's So Macho. <laughs> Falling in love for the first time with Michael J. Fox. Being mega at Space Invaders because my dad worked in an arcade and I had a full-size video game in my bedroom. Not getting to level 13 on Arkham Road 2 on my Atari ST. And a particular highlight I recall was thoroughly enjoying making a commemorative picture for the royal wedding of Sarah Ferguson and Prince Andrew. I come then to the art, culture and politics of the black art movement from an entirely historical perspective. On several levels, I am a stranger. 
And so what are the legacies of the black art movement to someone outside the culture and politics that created such art? My experience and research so far has revealed massive voids in the representation and information of the black art movement in the places supposedly representative of British art, by which I mean archives of national museums and galleries, university curricula, academia and publications. In my experience, representation of the black art movement in these areas is not widely or readily available and is often contradictory or inconsistent. An example of the voids and contradictions of the black art movement's legacies <coughs> in my research is my work on the late artist and poet Maud Salter. It was through Salter's work that I accidentally stumbled across the black art movement. It was in an undergraduate art history seminar at the University of Plymouth on Gregory L. Ulmer's essay of the notion of post-criticism. Our lecturer showed the class this image. He gave no title, he didn't name the artist, nor did he give any background information. He simply flashed the picture as we were leaving, as an apparent example of post-criticism, and then it was gone. That was during the winter semester of 2007. A year later, when I was writing my first essay for the Masters in Art History at the University of Leeds, I remembered the image, though interestingly, nothing of the lecture. I tracked down my previous lecturer to ask about the artwork. And so it was on the 10th of November, 2008, I received an email giving me the name Maud Salter. Immediately Googling the name, I was presented with an obituary in the Scottish Herald newspaper, stating she had died six months earlier, on the 27th of February, 2008. I was then shocked to discover that despite a passionate and productive career, Salter's death had gone largely unnoticed by many of the institutions that had employed and funded her, purchased from her and exhibited her works. People I contacted had no knowledge of her death and several institutions had no acknowledgement on their biographical pages, if they had any information at all on Salter. The v &A, which houses the series Sabat, um, still today has her as living. The more I learned about Salter's wide-ranging body of work, activism, perseverance and insistence, the more alarming to me her disappearance became. Salter's career included national and international exhibitions and representation, having works purchased by the Victoria and Albert Museum, and a Momot Fellowship at Tate Liverpool in 1991, with a residency culminating in the curating of Echo works by women artists, 1860 to 1940. Yet her activism and accolades now threaten to become meaningless in a British art canon that has forgotten the black art movement from its art history in education and in the archives of galleries and libraries. How can such an intensely active and determined individual disappear from the British art radar? This resonates with the focus of Salter's own projects, the preoccupation with the disappearance of black women from the historical canon. This whole notion of the disappeared, I think, is something that runs through my work I'm very interested in absence and presence in the way that particularly black women's experience and black women's contribution to culture is so often erased and marginalised. So that it's important for me as an individual and obviously as a black woman artist to put black women back in the centre of the frame, both literally within the photographic image but also within the cultural institutions where our work operates. But putting black women back into the centre of the frame, as Salter puts it, is no simple unearthing of women and inserting them into the canon. Instead, Salter plays with the ambiguities of fact and fiction, history and myth, complicating their narratives and our chronologies of knowledge. One of the women Salter consistently revisits in her artworks is Jeanne Duval, the actress and dancer of French and Haitian ancestry and the supposed mistress and muse to 19th century poet Charles Baudelaire. This image by the photographer Félix Nadar of an unknown woman 
has been taken by Salter and others to be Duval. Upon seeing the photograph of unknown woman in 1988, Duval then makes frequent appearances in Salter's imagery. She stared at me, Salter stated, willing me to give her a name, an identity, a voice. Later in her career, Salter began taking on that voice in her work, utilising Duval as a theme of self-portrayal in the 2002 National Gallery of Scotland commissions Le Bijou and Jean a Melodrama 1-4. Duval first emerged in Salter's work under the guise of Calliope, muse of epic poetry in the self-portrait from her series Zabat, Poetics of a Family Tree, in 1989. The Zabat series comprised nine large-scale colour photographic portraits created in the fashion of 19th century oil painting. Accompanying the photographs was a collection of texts entitled Zabat Narratives, which Salter wrote during the period when the photographs were being taken at a studio in Manchester. A year later, Salter also published a collection of poetry entitled uh, Zabat Poetics of a Family Tree. Commissioned by curator Jill Morgan at Rochdale Art Gallery, now Touchstones Rochdale, the Zabat series was organised for the 150 year anniversary of the invention of photography. The exhibition then toured several venues across Britain, with Zabat winning the New Contemporaries Award a year later. In 1991, all nine portraits were purchased from Rochdale by the Victoria and Albert Museum. The first museum, Salter happily tells us, she visited on moving to London in 1977. Zabat is perhaps the most well-known of Salter's artworks, due to the popularity of the Terpsichore portrait, which is still the most exhibited of the collection. That's the one at the bottom right, for those that don't know. Zabat was also Salter's first significant artwork, having been previously focused on writing and specifically poetry. The use of text and poetry in Salter's artworks <coughs> is an element that gives her work particular multi-layering, not often found in contemporary art. Seen by many as a poet first and foremost, and with only a small selection of artworks to her name, the richness and depth of those pieces is often overlooked. As a stranger to Salter, however, her artworks are a joy to unpack. Each of the Zabat photographs depicts a muse of ancient mythology. The nine daughters of Mnemosynine, goddess of memory, and Zeus, god of sky and thunder, often referred to as the father of the gods. <coughs> the, large scale of, the large scale of the portraits has considerable impact, each measuring approximately a metre and a half by just over a metre. The colours are vivid and lustrous. The cyberchrome technique Salter has employed to create the photographs is renowned for its richness of colour and especially its longevity. These portraits are not going to fade. This materiality of scale and vibrancy, vibrancy in Zabat, along with the presentation in traditional ornate gilt frames, is a distinct mark upon the Western art historical canon, directly referencing the tradition of 18th century oil portraiture in scale, rich materiality and presentation. The muses in Salter's Zabat, however, are not portrayed as unspecified white women, but instead are performed by active American and British, African and Caribbean women artists, writers, musicians and thinkers. <coughs> The dual dynamic of the photographs is that they function on both an allegorical level of creativity and as portraiture of nine contemporary black women who are agents of their own creativity. While Salter is challenging the absence of creative black women in Western art history and culture, she is also insisting on a powerful presence of contemporary living black women. Salter is not only highlighting the absence of black women through Western representations of history, but crucially, she reminds us black women are present. She interrupts the disappeared with these real women, each one their own creative genealogy. It is the active presence of these women that confronts the white, male-dominated histories of knowledge, art and culture, represented and ideologically upheld in Britain and Europe. 
The Women's Soul to Chose was about work in a range of arts in poetry, literature, dance, performance, music and education. Polyhymnia, the muse of sacred music and literally many songs, is portrayed by the American singer, musician and actor Dr. Yusei Barnwell, <coughs> who is depicting holding an egg and conveying ideas of life and perhaps maternal lineage. The contemporary artist Professor Lebena Hamid is seen depicting Urania, the muse of astrology. Farley, a muse of comedy and theatre, is portrayed by the novelist Alice Walker. Cleo, Muse of Heroic Poetry and History is performed by the poet Dorothea Smart. The Muse of Tragedy, Melpomene, often shown holding a knife or club in one hand and the tragic mask in the other, is here depicted by Abiola Agana. Pat Agana is seen portraying Euterpe, Muse of Music, seen with a traditional flute. Irata, a muse of lyric poetry, especially love and erotic poetry, is performed <coughs> by Dion Sparks. And Terpsichore, the muse of dance, perhaps Delta's best known piece from Zabat, is depicted by performance artist Delta Street. With the references to the 18th century oil paintings of past and the active presence of the women portrayed, Salter is ensuring that these portraits not only have a presence in contemporary art history, but also for future generations. While Salter works so hard to ensure that these portraits will not deteriorate and these nine women will not fade, paradoxically, her own career as a creative black woman has begun to disappear. The fading of Salter and her own narrative from Britain's art history is a poignant parallel to her own creative projects. Her career echoing the range of arts represented by the Zabat Muses spanned poetry, literature and art, as well as curating, publishing and teaching. The project of a feminist art history is one of excavation, exploration, and in a different way to Salter's project, a reimagination. The parallels between her real life and the lives she reimagined in her artworks are too poignant to ignore. Where is Salter in the archives? Where is she represented? Just as Salter is forced to imagine the narratives of her black women in her art, will we too be forced to imagine a history of Maud Salter? Having no idea about Salter or the black art movement in 1980s Britain, I have always found it a strange coincidence that Salter was the first artist I encountered of the period. A mercurial and intensely difficult character, so I'm told by some, passionate and strategic by others, I only imagine what she would make of me. Thank you. danger of missing our tea. So I am going to I'm going to ask you all to um, bear with us to have maybe two or three questions at the most so that we do get a quick tea break in and then Anna will we'll come back to you after the tea break. Yeah? Okay. So do we have some questions for Ella? Do we have some questions for Ella? I think at the, the, at the time when, when I saw it, because I think it was the last thing of the of the lecture when we first, you know, when we first saw it at that lecture, it's the last thing we saw, and so it was just this 
you know, the last thing of the whole lecture that, I, that, stayed, that stayed with me, but I'd never seen anything like it before at the time. Um, and when I returned to it, we were, uh, it, the essay that we were asked to write was just on <coughs> what our idea of art history was in terms of what we've been educated, how we've been educated so far. Um, and I just, I just remembered that, actually, because of the post-criticism part. All I remembered about it was this was a, a supposedly an example of post-criticism. And as soon as I got to her name, all of that kind of went out of the window because I frankly couldn't remember anything else about the lecture and what post-criticism was. Um, I think it was just that I'd not heard, I'd not seen anything like that, like that before. And then as soon as I, as soon as I realised that she had, and she died in the time between me seeing the image and then me going back and thinking, oh, what was that? What was that image? Which I was, you know, that made it even more. I don't know. Inter <coughs> interesting is a weak word to use for that, but you know, we want to know more about her. Debena. And do we have another question after the bonus? Because I do, I do have a question. I have a question that's kind of impossible to answer. I, I want to ask you a question. I, I want to do what um, Sai, when everyone else does it, just make a point, a very good point, um, about how, how, uh, how in Britain you, you have to belong to one cultural space in order to be archivized, archivized. You can't, you're not a, we, we've set up a system where you're not allowed to be what she was, um, a fantastically interesting poet, um, a curator, um, a writer, um, an artist, and, an, and a, a painter and a photographer. You know, she had the audacity to be a painter as well as being a photographer. Uh, you know, so, you, if that's what you do, if you spread yourself about um, in the pursuit of keeping all sorts of other things alive and, and conversations uh, uh, going, you inevitably annihilate yourself. Let that be a warning to you. Um, but the question is an impossible question. The question is, because I think about it often, more often than I should probably, but what do you think she might be making now? <laughs> what a horrible question. <laughs> the same question is waiting for them to be Oh, well. I can't answer. Yeah, I can't answer that. I mean, I'm trying to think of what she was making, you know, her most recent things that she was making, um, which was the, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the jewels. Oh, it won't let me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry, it's taking forever, but... Here, yeah, on the... On the left there, so and she was, I think she was getting more and more into into the self self portraiture and the idea of I don't know kind of um, I don't likening herself is probably not the right way to put it, but with with Jean Duval and doing more and more work about that. But I don't. I'm yeah, it's very interesting. I think about. It. Right, could I just uh, uh, as well just, uh, just thought of something else on you for your um, your question. Um, which was that when I was saying that I'd never seen anything like it before, that that's what made me go back go back to it. But then as soon as I started to learn about what was um, about all of our artworks, and then I was introduced to you know the whole of the black art movement, um, that's what kept me. That's what really cemented me to to carry on going with it and with her work because I'd been to three separate higher and further education institutions being taught fine art and art history, two in the south and one in the north, and I had never been, it was never on any, in any classes on my curriculum, and now as a teacher, you know, I want to know, I want to know this, this Britain that I don't, that I don't know, and this movement which for me defines the whole of the, the 1980s artistically, and I, and I need to know it if I'm an art historian and I'm, and I'm teaching students. <laughs>
I can see a number of hands. I'm really good. If we don't finish, we are not going to get tea. So, no, no, you have, you've got the mic, so ask your question. Okay, Paul Lee Bailey. Um, in addition to the question that Rubin was asking, I just wondered that um, while you were researching this work from Maud, um, whether you uncovered, I mean, I'm assuming this is some of the work that you uncovered that she was currently working on just before she died, is that right? Um, these are all, they're all finished pieces. Um, I think she stopped working uh, of anything that I, anything properly finished quite a few years before she, before she died. 2005. So three, yeah. Um, I, I've just got one other question that's generally to the room. Um, following on from, again from what uh, uh, Habina said was, you know, the, the idea of those of and I'm one of those artists that works in several media, and I belong to any particular, um, <coughs> which, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, like, so in a way I'm kind of, I'm kind of annihilate, annihilating myself, and I don't really feel like that right now. Um, so whether or not anybody has any views on how you you kind of counter that. I, I think I'm sorry, I'm gonna I know I said that Paul was gonna be back top, but it's me. I think that is definitely a plenary question. Yes. <laughs> so can we pause there, have tea in fifteen minutes, please fifteen minutes, and come back and have us. Thank you very much. Okay.